Um, my name is Sonam Shah, and thank you all for coming. I knew it was kind of monsooning earlier, so I was kind of excited that maybe a lot of you wouldn't show up. This is one of my first times doing this. Um, but I am a senior product manager at Grubhub, and how did I get here? So about me, I graduated from New York University uh, with a minor, a major in economics and international business, and I minored in psychology. Nothing that really helped me do what I do today. Um, and after I graduated from NYU, I actually started off at American Express and what at the time we called digital strategy. That was before product management became really cool. Um, and before it was a term or a title or really anything around product management. And I was at American Express in a variety of roles. My first one being um, like a content management analyst for the internal systems, moving into other larger digital strategy projects. And actually, in 2016, when I was still with American Express, I took one of the first courses with product school around product management. Um, because even though I had the experience, I found it I, interesting in terms of how to jump from a digital strategy role to a technically a product manager role when I was trying to interview. And then, I love American Express, so if anyone wants to go there, highly, highly suggest it. Um, but after that, I, while I loved the company, I knew that I wanted to potentially take a stab at a smaller startup. So I joined MediaBricks. Uh, six months after I joined, we rebranded to Receptive. A year later, we were acquired by Verve. Um, that's all digital advertising. Two years there, I learned a lot. It was very, very fast-paced as opposed to American Express. But digital advertising is not my thing. Um, I did not like it. I needed to go back to a place where the customer was important and the product that I was working on was important to the customer. Did I find sending ads to people while they were trying to get to like the next level of Mineral Candy Crush? No, that was annoying, right? Um, I was like, I need to get out of this. And so about six months ago, I joined Grubhub. Um, I love Grubhub too. Uh, I am on the corporate team. So a lot of people, and I didn't know this before I started, we all know Seamless or Grubhub as consumer. We order the food every day. There is a huge portion of Grubhub that is corporate which is what Seamless started as, right? So partnerships with banks and law firms, everyone who essentially needs to feed their employees when they're working overtime, et cetera. And so the, I'm on the corporate team, which is, I think of it as B to B, B to B to C. We're working on, we have the relationships with these enterprises, these companies, but at the end of the day, we're working on making it seamless for their diners to eat. So. That's where I am and why am I here? So I know one of the things that I wanted to do was get more involved in public speaking. I think that's a very crucial trait for product management. You have to be comfortable presenting to a lot of people. Um, and I do that on a regular basis, but that's about my work that I'm very involved in. And so I wanted to, feedback is welcome at the end of this. Um, when I was trying to think of what would be useful or like if I attended why, what I would get out of it, I knew I wanted it to be tangible, um, but I also know that I wanted it to be applicable to your day jobs and potentially for those who are interviewing, provide some sort of framework that could help you there. So I wanna to talk today about product design thinking um, and one of the frameworks that's really out there is circles and it's only because it's easy to rem remember. A lot of what is in this method, I end up doing on a regular basis, do I, you know, do this framework step by step? Absolutely not, so that is a big caveat, but again, it's a good way to think about your problems and what you're trying to do. Um, we're gonna go through each of these, but the first one being comprehend the situation, You know, get the context of whatever you're trying to do, identify your customer. Obviously, without our customers, we wouldn't be building any products and whatever their needs are, followed by prioritization, listing your solutions, and then evaluating trade-offs, why one solution versus another, and then finally summarizing your recommendation. And often this one in, at least Grubhub, it's a lot about writing product briefs. You're gonna go through everything you've, the different scenarios, and then write up a brief before your design teams, engineering teams, et cetera, will even talk to you about it. Um, in an interview, 
you know, you're summarizing for your interviewer. So applicable, but not necessarily, you don't have to follow this step by step is a big thing. So the first one, comprehending the situation. So if I asked you guys, make me a lasagna, make all lasagna, what are you gonna do? Are you just gonna make the lasagna? Mm. Huh? Find a recipe? Okay. Check my preference. Yep. Check pantry for ingredients. Ingredients, recipes, my preferences. Uh Allergies. Why you want to make Why? That's the first question. Why? Why am I make why am I creating this product? You're all correct. All I mean I asked my husband this when I was practicing earlier, and he was just like, I would just make it. And I was like, no. Um, but why am I making this lasagna? For who? Is it, are you making it for me? Are you making it for 10 people? Are you making it for 20 people? When am I making it? If I need it in a month from now, what is the point if you make it today? Where am I gonna make it? Allergies, all of that. You have to get the background, right? So the way I like to think about it in terms of product Every company has high level two goals. Yes, when you're working on a product, it's going to be specific metrics or key performance indicators that you're trying to move forward. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the context, you may not make it that far. So what are, how is the company successful? What are the two main things they look at? Sure. Money. Money, increasing revenue, right? So overall, does this increase my revenue? And what's the other big one? Huh, sorry? Profit. profit. So that one sort of falls under revenue. So that one, I'm come back one, come back to that one. If I'm not increasing revenue, how else am I going to be successful? By keeping my costs low, right? So anytime you're building a feature, a product, you make customer engagement maybe a thing, or how many clicks am I getting, or a journey, all of those yes work, but at the end of the day, are they driving revenue or are they decreasing cost? So you're going to have high level KPIs, but also very specific to your product. But again, at the end of the day, think about where it falls into. Obviously, the middle one, who and why, what is the problem it's going to be solving for our customers? And I think this is a big one um, that I encourage even when you have interviews is data. You know, especially at Grubhub, everything is so data-driven. Data is sometimes hard to get, uh, and so you keep asking the questions, but a lot of it needs to be potentially even directional. You need to justify why we're doing this. Um, one of my last projects before I left American Express was called Digital First. And I'd love for you guys to sort of help me think through what you would have done if you were tasked with improved digital experiences for card members to reduce call volume, what questions would you have? What questions are the card members asking? What questions are the card members? Why are they calling? Right? Why are they calling? What else? How often are they calling? How often are they calling? Yep. Who is calling? Who is calling? Definitely. So essentially grouping together the reasons they're calling. What goal is this? What's the goal of this? What are we trying to do? Reduce call volume, which in turn will reduce, reduce costs, right? Now their question is, by how much am I trying to reduce call volume and in what time frame? Because based on those answers, your product strategy will definitely change. If it's just trying to get quick wins, you're gonna to try to do very small, low effort things. And if it's a longer strategy that they actually wanna put in place, that is also gonna take the time to do it, right? So, yeah. Moving on to, so once you have the background, identify the customer. So I think you back there said, uh, essentially personas, right? Like who are the types of people calling? So let's continue with that scenario. 
you're working for American Express, you're trying to reduce call volume. What kinds of people do you think are calling? Older demographic, yes. Um, new users, experienced users, people who are potentially not a user anymore. Yep, so new users. Again, you can break this down in so many different ways, right? So one of them is new users, old users, but not old, but experienced users. Uh, and then if we went his route, it could be, yeah, repeating, right? Repeating users. Potentially also, though, if you even move out of the financial space, you could have, and this is you know, something we actually used to do, we used to group these demographics together. So you have middle-aged moms. You have millennials. Millennials was a huge you know, bucket that we used to look after. Then you have people who don't use technology. And then you're going into why. Why are those people calling? So why do you guys call credit card companies? Why? Fraud. 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 Okay, for to dispute a fraud, fraudulent charge. Pay a bill. Pay a bill. Travel notifications. Travel notifications. Did you know that actually no credit card company does anything with that information because they already know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, fraud claims. Fraud claims. Yep. Replace a credit card. Right. Check. You know. Check balances. So. Once you've identified your personas, essentially your customers, and you need to identify why either they want to use your product or why you want them to use your product, right? And so we here have identified different reasons why they're using them. So your stories, you know, or your, the reasons or these user stories could be to, you wanna improve the disputes journey so you have less disputes call volume or for travel notification, if it's a push notification or if it's a quick button that they can just toggle on the app, right? Then you're, not, you're gonna save hundreds of thousands of calls. So essentially, identifying the customer, and this is a good way, I personally think, to write even a user story. As a, sometimes I don't even put in a persona, given that you know, we know our personas when we're working with our teams. But as a user, I want to order a large, you know, a, I want to place large orders from Grubhub so that I could feed a party, right? So the catering, like little different things like that. So after you've identified your customer and you have reported their needs, comes prioritization. So I guess whoever thought of this framework put in the cut because prioritization doesn't fit into the circles framework. But how do you guys prioritize? High level, if one of your friends asked you to, all right, where, where do you live? Uh, I live in San Francisco. You're here from San Francisco? We'll get to work. Oh, okay. This is looking for this stuff. Okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> okay, so let's say you live in San Francisco. Let's say, you know, you have, uh, no, I don't even know places. Who lives in, in the tri state area? <laughs> okay, where do you live? Harlem. Harlem, okay. So let's say you have a friend who, you know, an acquaintance that invites you to brunch in Gowanus. How do you make your decision if you're gonna go? Um, I guess the weather. Okay. Um, I think about transportation and transport time. Yeah. How good is this friend to me? Yep. Um, you know, with the kind of food that's there, have I not been to the restaurant in a while? Yeah. So everything you're describing totally makes sense. And essentially you're calculating the value you're gonna get from doing this over the effort you're going to be putting in to do this, right? That's how we all make our decisions. What am I gonna get out of this and what do I need to do in order to do this? And that is very real world, even product prioritization. It's essentially reach. So how many users is this going to be affecting, right? Take the disputes example from the credit card example. Let's say American Express gets, making this up, 20 million calls a year just for disputes. Whatever you're trying to, to your, whatever feature or product you're trying to do, are you gonna get all 20 million? No, right? 
And so to a degree, you're going to have to, whether it's user testing with your, the, your feature, right, figure out a confident enough number that you think potentially can reduce a portion of that 20 million. You're not going to get every single user to do every single thing with your product. And there is impact. What do you guys think impact means in this scenario? How effectively your team can solve the problem? Yeah, how thoroughly are you going to solve this problem, this disputes problem, for these 14 million, let's say, you estimated users? And then there is effort. Effort is usually how many sprints is it going to take one engineer to accomplish this task, but it could mean different things company to company. So up here, I like to think of it as your value, and obviously down here is the effort you're putting in. I think there is a similar framework called RICE, and it's reach times impact times confidence. How confident are you in your estimates over effort? I don't know. I, I stick to this. Um, so once you've prioritized, right, then it's the fun part of listing solutions. On the solution side, so again, it depends on your timeline, your goal, but often, you know, the simple solutions are the best solutions and often testable. So we actually at Grubhub just did a week-long hackathon where we had about 150 teams participate. And one of the, my team did, you know, hack and for about three days of the whole hackathon, we were debating between two solutions, constantly back and forth on it. And yes, it was important to win the hackathon, but also it was important to, can we actually implement this? Is it simple enough? It's a, it's a product that doesn't exist today. We can put in three months of development work. Who is going to use it? We have no idea. And so initially, it's all about making it simple and then testing it out, right? Even going back to American Express, when I was doing this digital first thing, I bring up disputes often because everyone thought disputes was the magic bullet. Like if for somehow we made that journey the easiest, we wouldn't have calls. Obviously not true, right? For a bunch of reasons, but I bring it up with testable because we then ran a small test with our call, uh, call center professionals. We call them CCPs. And you know, we asked at the end of each call, especially for those that have digital journeys available as an option, just ask why, did they try digital first? And if so, why did they call you? And if they didn't, they didn't. And from there, we actually found out that 40% of you know, that sample size did try digital first. But they couldn't find what they were trying to do. And they, even if they found it, it wasn't intuitive. And so our biggest learning from that is a lot of the things that they're trying to do are just not discoverable. And maybe it's, why don't we just test, you know, do an AB test, change the layout of some, you know, some of our account pages to then make it easier for them. And that test actually showed a 50% increase, almost a 50% increase in some of these journeys being completed. So sometimes it's not solving the biggest, the loudest problem, it's also testing and solving problems that aren't the loudest. And the other one is obviously have empathy. So again, if I lost my credit card, I may do go through the app, but there are certain things that are so emotional for people that they are going to call regardless, and just in that example. But for any product, you need to try to have empathy and really understand if you were in those shoes, are you not going to call? Because then going back to the reach estimate, again, you're not going to get those 20 million or however many. You're going to only get a fraction of them. So it's being able to, to recognize that. And evaluating trade-offs. So defining you know, your criteria and then comparing your solutions. So even when we did our hackathon and we had these two great ideas, you always have to understand the limitations of your ideas um, and be able to call them out because you're not going to be able to build a perfect product. If you do, please let me know. But you will have limitations. And even the product briefs we write at Grubhub, it's very important to call out 
those, but also what's not in scope. Maybe it's just a limitation for now and for the future you will include it. But for this MVP, it is absolutely not in scope, right? And then finally, summarizing your recommendations. You know, what's the goal? Why are we doing this? And why is it a better idea against all of your other ideas? Also, you know, helpful in interviews and helpful. This is essentially a product brief. Business value, the problem, your solution, limitations, and why is it better? And I started with this, but I also want to kind of end with this, that product design thinking is absolutely not linear. So often you will start with context, and you will identify customers, and it sort of goes through here. And when you're here, and you're going back and forth with your engineering team, telling, they're telling you that's not possible and you're crazy, you're sort of going to have to work back a little bit and keep going forward. And it's a continuous cycle. It's definitely very iterative. So even though there are frameworks that will point you in the direction, it's absolutely not that at all. Um, so that was the end of my talk. But I would love to answer any questions around anything I talked about, Amex, digital advertising, Grubhub. Yeah? On your last slide, you talked yeah. about business value, right? Mm -hmm. How do you measure that? What are the KPIs? Uh, are they forward looking? Uh, most of the KPIs are backward looking. Totally. You know, once you put in your MVP and then you're waiting for the results. Yeah. So, how do you balance those? How do you have some backward looking KPIs and some forward looking KPIs? KPIs? Yeah. So, often for the business value, I will all go back to that goal. Like, what was that? Was that revenue? Was it increasing that revenue? And then, obviously, you have to quantify it. So if I'm going to high level, if it's current business that I'm trying to grow, these are the behaviors I see in the current business using for, for Grubhub. You know, for uh, one of the ideas we're working on, it's easy to measure potentially how much current business we can grow. It is right now impossible for us to measure new business that that idea is going to generate. And so we are looking at the industry, industry figures, looking at consumer behavior. And, and, and the goal, again, yes, you're right. The goal is very arbitrary in terms of it will increase revenue. We know it will increase this much revenue. But it's how much new potential revenue it can bring is very hazy that we're trying to figure out. Right, so you look at the market size, and then you evaluate your product yeah. based on yeah. the MVP. But then there is also some adoption time, right? Because if you release it, let's say, today, <coughs> next two or three weeks, It'll be nothing. Yeah. You know, so, so how do you have to, what are those milestones kind of, you know, where you can keep your sponsors, you know, a little quiet? Quiet. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and basically tell them it's going to work. Yeah. Where, where we haven't reached that point yet, but it's going to work. So yeah. So that's a really great question. I think, A, you have to be really close to your stakeholders, right? And it's a lot of, we can build this product, but this product is not going to sell itself. So at least you know where we are at Grubhub, and it's a lot of working with marketing and sales and all of those to A, explain your product so then they can go out and do lead gen, but also we can put this feature out. What types of marketing is going to go in, whether it's email marketing, anything, right? And really understand, and then as a group, agree on by you know, that three-month mark, we want, to we want to see where we are. So right now, for what we do is we have weekly monitoring you know, all of our KPIs, but then also quarterly, and goals against both. And at that point, it's assessing, A, was that goal accurate? Right? Was it doable? Sometimes it's an arbitrary goal that we've, we've set against baselines. But then checking product performance, iterating, and then you know, obviously realizing maybe the product is really not performing to what we thought. Let's, let's go back through that cycle again. So. That's what we currently do. Yeah. For mature or seasoned products, when you're looking to make uh, do a facelift or a big UX change, people are the users are already used to having a certain sort of experience on it. So when you're say like obviously you would want to do mm -hmm. either a beta test or a mm -hmm. test, how do you decide when it's been long enough to read the metrics, or what do you do when you sort of don't get the signals that indicate you're making the right change? 
It's a good question. So hopefully you're also doing user testing. Um, so yes, and AB, you know, that experiment is obviously crucial, but throughout doing UX research with sitting down with and just making sure that it's what's not easy to understand, you're getting all of that feedback throughout. Usually, and it depends, right? So like at an American Express, because it's a financial services firm, some of their tests are going to be much longer. And they're, it's just company-wide, you're not that receptive to a flip. Places like Grubhub, they just flip it on, you know? So for those, that could be two weeks. So like right now, it's between two to four weeks for those huge facelifts. And again, going back to, if you're not getting those indicators, going back to more user testing, changing, potentially add in a third you know, variant or pull, pull back, add in a new variant and compare that. But then sometimes it's going to have to be, you're gonna to have to fail. And you have to be okay with failing. Easier said than done, obviously, as long as it's not impacting your revenue, right? But obvious, if it is, then you have to pull back immediately. So, it's, it's, so again, I think that one depends on the industry you're in as well. Because there are some industries that are much more tolerant to changes as opposed to, you know, again, at financial services, like every, even every small little like color needed to be approved by legal compliance, fraud, like everywhere. So it depends on where you are. How do you identify good like leading and lagging metrics that can kind of let you know whether your product's doing well or not so well? I think that goes back to understanding the background and also like why, why do you have this product? Um, so, for example, we, we, you know, we have catering as a business, and obviously it would be great to have just monitor catering weekly, like just volume, um, but sometimes when we are making any changes, we go back to really understanding which metrics around so, and, and trends, right? So, historical data, so we'll go back to even year over year. For certain months where we see big drops or big jumps, like is this seasonal? Is this just random? That one I think is tough because it's gonna be very product specific. Very product specific. Yeah. Um, I actually have a question about when you were at the startup. Yeah. So obviously um, with the pressure to deliver at a startup is a lot more intense than at major companies. Totally. Did your prioritization, the way you approach prioritizing, differ greatly across the startup environment and the mature companies? Yes. Um, In what way? And at um, a startup, we essentially said, yes, we can do it, and then had to figure out how to do it, as opposed to let us figure out how to do this and then we'll tell you if we can do it or can't do it. Um, so it was a lot of just saying yes, figuring it out, and there were also no sprints, right? And so it was, it was the, at least at the startup I was at, it was a very Kanban approach with everyday releases, just a daily setups, no structure in that sense. And so, yes, the prioritization was still value, uh, sort of that reach times impact, but Often it would be, we have said yes to this, we are going to do this. And so that I think sometimes was, yep, yeah, this may be not be the right thing for most of our customers, but often if it was right for the big customers, it was done. Yeah. Uh, kind of similar question, but I was wondering how different the scope of your role is at the startup versus at Grubhub. It's kind of like a day day, like Yes, so we have a very staff team. At Grubhub, the product itself is so big. And I think it's, we don't realize it as a consumer of the product, but the product itself is massive. And so right now, I, when I signed on for Grubhub, I had, my scope was this. But at this point, I am doing all of these different things. And actually, this started happening as of you know three weeks ago because now I finally understand the business that I'm in. So it's a lot of juggling things that absolutely do not relate to each other, but also at the micro and macro level. And I think I'm trying to improve answering like, oh, what are we, you know, what's this, like where is a specific ticket at versus what is the strategy for this? Where I think at the startup, the product itself was smaller. Um, there were only two product owners. 
and we just worked together side by side. I think at a Grubhub, when there are so many different products, there are also that many different engineering teams. And it's just like, well, you didn't tell us that was going to go live. And they're like, oh, well, it's live now. And so it's a lot of backpedaling, bug fixes, all of that, where when it was that two-person team, I knew what my counterpart was working on, and you know, we were good. But here, we ha I mean, my, my entire product team is, is massive, and often it's every two weeks when we have our team meeting, I'm like, oh, this is what you're doing today. Um, so I think it's, and I'm still figuring it out because at American Express, I think it was similar, but Grubhub is very fast moving. Um, so trying to continuously being able to know what I'm working on, managing all of that, but then trying to figure out what my team is working on. Yeah. Could you uh, pick a use case from your Grubhub uh, experience and talk about like the iteration process and how do you learn from it? And then how do you make a decision whether you want to go forward or you want to just abort the uh, idea itself? Abort the mission. Um, yeah. So this came out um, of our hackathon idea, right? So we have a huge corporate business. And two ideas came out. One of them was right now when large companies do orders, so it's like 30, 40 meals at once, and the, the delivery driver comes, goes to the bottom of the building, you know, hands it off, right? And eventually someone that from there is pinged and they, they go up, they have all their food. So it's usually the admin. And that admin is manually letting each diner know or each employee know your food is here, your food is here, come get it, et cetera, right? When there's a big group order as opposed to individual orders. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is make it easier for that, um, that admin to just let the entire group know your food is here as opposed to individual things. And we have looked into potentially like quick Slack integration, or maybe they'll scan a QR code on the receipt and it'll notify every diner that was in there. Different solutions and, and trying to really figure out what is gonna involve the lowest level of effort and actually work. And we designed something and then sort of pulled back because that design, I mean, yes, it's super valuable, but is actually adding any value to the company in terms of revenue or cost. A lot of the other initiatives we're working on are. This one is increasing customer satisfaction, but not adding to the bottom line, because if we do this or don't do this, those customers are still going to order. Um, so that's one sort of thing to you know really, like, what goal is this working towards um, before continuing to do it? We would love to still do it. I think it's just deprioritized against some of our other priorities. Uh, and then the other one that we're thinking through um, is you know how to easily allow diners to expense their charges on corporate cards and stuff. That one is that would be amazing, but that one is very involved, and it involves a new service and the designs and thinking through you know if someone cancels their order, how do you handle with that? So thinking through all those scenarios, well, we would love to do that. There's no one on our team that has the time to do the discovery and the comprehending that entire situation. So that is also backlog, though we think it can potentially increase revenue. The other items on our development list will directly increase revenue that we just have to focus on. I don't know if that helped you. That was very good. Okay. <laughs> and how long does it take uh, to make a decision? Like, how does the decision process look like? Like, you definitely have to rely on the data points, right? So you want, like, you know, forty percent data to be available to make a decision, or sixty percent data to be available to make a decision, or you know, hundred percent. Yeah, you're never gonna get a hundred percent. You're lucky if you get fifty. Yeah, it's in that forty sixty range, uh, and sometimes you know. When you ask the same question to three people, you'll get three different numbers. So it's, it's also trying to look through that and sometimes realizing that you're not going to have an answer. So what is directional? If everyone's sort of saying, yes, this will see an increase, the direction is, yes, this will help. Can we tell you exactly by how much? Sometimes, no. So I think you're right. It's that 40, 60%. Yeah. Back there. So when testing potential new solutions, um, how often do you test and how big of a sample size do you use? Or how, how do you figure that part out? We test everything. 
uh, nothing goes out without testing. Um, because that's when you find bugs, right? And, and I think, again, because Grubhub is so big, you may be doing X, we're doing Y. We have no idea how X and Y are going to work together. And then when we do put that together, it's like, well, can't launch this because it is buggy as hell. Um, you test everything with design. Design needs to test about 48 hours before anything goes you know, live. And then we have dedicated QA that you know, ideally, we as product managers, we're like, oh, you could do it in two days. They're like, no, we can't do it in two days. So it, again, depends on the project. But right now, I have something launching next week. I have someone writing all the test cases. Something will go into pre-prod, ideally Friday. And then Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is just testing until we are 99% sure that this is something we can launch with the ability never launching on Fridays, and just in case something goes wrong, you need to, to you know, pull that back in. So ideally launching earlier, and then, but also being, have the, having the flexibility to rein it in. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned that you had determined that A-B testing would solve uh, initial disease like the Yeah, yeah. Rather than solving like a larger router question? Yeah. Like, how do you determine that A-B testing that is a great question. And I think it came because we did a survey. We asked our CCPs to do a survey and just to understand, are people even trying digital first? So is it the issue where they're not trying digital at all, and that is an education issue or marketing issue, et cetera? Or is it that they are trying digital first, and then they don't know what to do? Because then that's a product issue. Right? And based on that data, we determined that it was a product issue. Then digging deeper into the reasons of what they were trying to do, yes, we could have just done a whole redesign. But again, a redesign takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. So before doing that, in order to even prove that we should do a redesign, we did the A-B test. And, and the test was yeah, different layout, like super, you know, keeping the same designs, nothing, no rebranding, none of that, just placements of different things were differently, and we did a 50-50 A-B test. Yeah. So then, to your point, do the redesign and then potentially reduce that call volume. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for each of the steps that you took uh, as you walked us through the yeah. and the product design framework, what is the definition of done? Or where do you know you draw mm -hmm. the line and you move on to the next step? To me, definition of done is whatever scope you've defined in your MVP. And assuming, again, that MVP is tangible, it's an actual deliverable product, for that iteration, that is the definition of done. Well, uh, let me elaborate. Right? Yeah. So the Amex example that you mentioned, right? mm -hmm. so we're, we're talking about, say, uh, millions of users over there who are, who are calling on, on a monthly basis, say, for example. Uh, where do you know that these are my, is, is this an 80 20 principle, or where do you know that this is where I stop? Because you can potentially have different reasons for all of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is more around, where do you know this is where I want to end up? Totally. For large projects like that, you have to break out each different thing, right? And so let's say this dispute thing. If we do this, and if we think it's going to reduce call volume by X percent of the total, that's one piece and you pick another one, if that's going to do Y percent, that's another thing. And then at the end of the day, you have that plan. You may not even get to 100% of it, but at the end of the day, I think it's at 80%. If you're there, that 80-20, usually that is the definition of done. Yeah. Um, I'm actually a product designer for like, startups. So oh. I think I, I, I think both have the jobs right now. Yeah, so probably. If, if you're like, like a bigger corporation, how do you define how do you guys differentiate between like product designers and uh, product managers? Mm -hmm. like, how do you guys differentiate it? How do we differentiate jobs like product design jobs versus? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So product design, do you mean like actual designing the like actual design work? Yeah, but like also like product designer also feel like keep like asking why we do like defining the, the KPIs. Yeah. Also like um, we can do product strategies. Yeah. Like it is very overlapping. Yeah, it's a good question. So 
in my point of view, I think the product manager is responsible for creating that product brief and doing a lot of the, the heavy lifting, but I think it's very, very important to bring in your, the product design team, the engineers, because again, your perspective is not the only one. And I think per, you know, when you get the different use, I think the product designers are very crucial because they are the voice of the customer, right? And they are acting on behalf of the customer, so bringing them in, getting their perspective, and then also engineers in terms of is this actually feasible or not? It's an overlap. There is no, it's, you know, it's a totally a Venn diagram, and that middle, especially the KPIs and the why. Why is this the right thing to do? Why lasagna? That is entirely a product designer sort of role to even ask. And if you guys want to be one sprint, and are you guys we participate in the grooming when I do have a design feature, uh, and we participate in the testing. Yeah, we don't participate in their sprint planning or anything. Essentially, if it's once it's groomed, they'll figure out who and when and where. Yeah, yeah. How do you prioritize between a bug fix that is impacting the user experience? or a new feature that's going to add value to your product overall, with limited resources, of course. Yeah, if the bug fix is hurting my bottom line, affecting users from actually using the product, that is the priority. If it in any way is detrimental to the core business, 100%, that is being focused on. Um, if it's a product bug that actually no users are really complaining about, we just sort of discovered, and it's not affecting anyone or a small percentage, based on where we are in our current sprint, doing whatever we are with a feature, mm -hmm. maybe we continue that. It's, it's really just comparing, is, are you hurting my bottom line bug? And if you are, you're priority. Your priority. Yeah. yeah. Um, when there is a huge change in your customer base, how do you go about determining what the cause of that? Mm -hmm. When there is a huge change in your customer base. Yeah. I would, I would, that's a great question. Looking at his, I would look at historical data. I would also try to see, like, have we launched anything new? What has, what have we launched in the X amount of time going back? What is the engagement for those different things? Are there any external factors? Right? I think that's a big one, especially now with like social media, like a lot of the news and all of that that's going on. Are there any external factors that are impacting this? Uh, and then still looking at trend data. Is this happening with only me or also my competitors? Is this, you know, making this up, but like in the, when it was monsooning like two weeks ago, it was like a crazy raid on a Wednesday. I mean, seamless orders were through the roof in New York, right? And so, the next day, like coming back and analyzing, a how do, how do we deliver? Like doing you know all of that analysis. When it's about a customer base, I think that has to be a much larger analysis. But when it's like a daily spike or something totally random has happened, what do we launch? Is it a problem? Is it a bug that's causing this, or is it an actual expected behavior? And if it's not expected, is it a trend? You had a question. I was. I was a. I was a product manager there. Yeah. That's a great question too. Um, so. I think we're at where a lot of companies, besides the startup, there are different criteria, and it's usually company defined, but what constitutes a PM1, a PM2, a senior PM, et cetera. And so some of that is definitely skill set, like technical skills and experiences. And the other one is your, you know, your relationship management, a lot of your softer skills. And I think for me, I knew even at American Express, that's what I had wanted to do. I got at my ad tech. Uh, startup phase, I got a bunch of management experience with like, you know, not directly under me, but sort of tertiary. Um, and that was something I had explicitly told my boss when I was interviewing at Grubhub. 
because he had asked me like, where, how do you want your career to progress? Like do you individual contributor, manager, et cetera. Um, and to me, it was very important because I had never directly managed anyone to figure out if I liked it or not. Yeah, it was great when I didn't actually have to do all the management work and they were tertiary. Um, so with that, this, uh, you know, this summer I have an intern, I'm also managing an analyst um, and getting that experience. But I think it's very important if that is important to you to communicate that to your manager. Like in terms of title? Yeah, I mean, I'm just like, what you said about whoever you're talking The conversation, about, yeah. Where you want to take your career, um, were you already in the company for a few, like, yeah. before you asked that? Yeah. So I, I did mention it at my interview, but we have those conversations quarterly oh, okay. in terms of, I'm, and often I will bring it up, like we have our mid-years coming in the next uh, week or so, but it's often... I know, you know, my, for my me personally, a lead would be the next move, right? And so it's a what constitutes a lead at Grubhub? Where am I right now? Performing as a senior PM, is it at par or is it better? Sort of on the way to a lead, and what do I need to do to get there? I think I'm more comfortable with those conversations now. Had you asked me this like two years ago, I would have never brought it up, but I now bring it up even in my conversations when I am interviewing because while they are interviewing me, I also know that I want to work for this boss and this boss will help me move my career forward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, uh, the product team and Trevor is fairly large. So the two parts of my question. Yeah. One, uh, you know, one of, if you can, you know, the broadly give us, a, you know, a, overview. A, a picture or a, yeah, an overview, if you will, you know, yeah. of, of how the team's organized. And secondly, you mentioned that there's one way you try to uh, ensure that all the parts sort of work together is through the meetings, through the bi-weekly meetings that you have, but then uh, are there other techniques that you see being used to ensure that there's, you know, changes in one part of the product do not necessarily hamper or break the other part of the product? Are yeah, I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, the product teams at Grubhub are organized, so there is the diner core component. Obviously what you guys see as consumers, mm -hmm. there's an entire team focused to that. There is an entire team, which is my team, focused on corporate. What that means is, again, we have uh, non-diner, like non-user, end-user facing tools to set up these corporations, allow them to do, you know, give them line of credit, which I don't know if any of you have corporate accounts, but it's a, you know, big companies can say every day you have $25 and it's just less, sort of like a debit card, um, a virtual debit card. So that's my team. And we're doing a lot of things like catering and all of that falls under our umbrellas. And there's a whole restaurant team. How do you set up restaurants? Again, things that diners don't get to see, but how do you set up menus? All of that. And there's a whole team focused on that. And there's also restaurant apps, which, you know, how do they get orders? Apps are entirely built on making it a good experience for restaurants themselves who are getting these orders. And there's another driver facing team. How do you make it easy for drivers to get orders, making sure they're going on time? All of these things. So there are, there's a restaurant component, drivers, diners, and then corporate. Just one more question, and then after that, I would like to have some time for 15 minutes to mingle. Yeah. Uh, I think, well, I, I'm just going to answer your second part. Um, so the corporate team itself has, you know, biweekly, just my, my director team has these biweekly team meetings. But other than that, you're very much encouraged to say, hey, I know this is your domain, like you are the PM for diner payments. I'm working on something that I think will touch it. I'm just gonna set up time with you. I'm working on something to increase you know, catering orders. Right now, we see a bug, especially for small markets, where like that catering link doesn't appear. I know who owns that. I'm just gonna be like, okay, what do we need to do to fix this? Because this is going, this is against my goals. You own this area, this page, what do we do? So it's very much encouraged to just just, uh, what is the saying? Ask for forgiveness, not permission, something like that. That one. <laughs> yeah. I think it's more specific 
drought top and your role at drought top. Um, I was kind of wondering what's kind of what's the relationship between the and the engineering team and the touch base and the database, weekly base, uh, just the work and once the PRD is done and then the EM picks it up and yeah. That's a great question. Um, engineering teams at Grubhub are, it's, it's, it's like initiative based. So corporate is a huge initiative right now for the company. So we have like dedicated teams who can work on that. I have daily stand up with my team. Um, often I'll meet with them several times to think through at like work together. And then if we have to work on things that touch other services that different engineering teams work on. I think I'm unique right now in that my engineering leads will just literally take the lead and go do that. But often there will be times when PMs have to go talk to other teams themselves. So I am lucky in that way that my leads will go do all of that. But we do retros, we have daily standups, um, and we do have a weekly meeting with my director, the engineering director that we work closely with, my leads, and myself. So at least our bosses are aware because I have you know, like eight other PMs on my team. And our bosses need to be aware of all the priorities across all of us. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you.